All right, well, thank you all for being on the, uh, the Zoom call this morning. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, this is session number five. And as I told you from the very beginning, we're going to get a little bit more specific as we go through these sessions. And so uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, my book, Think Up, How to Think Up and Be Successful in Fundraising. Uh, and so uh, we'll have some stories that I'm going to tell. And there's a, there's some uh, lessons to be learned from those stories. So I want you to pay close attention to some of that. And, uh, you know, then again, we're recording this. I think, uh, I, again, I've, I've said this from the very beginning. I think that it's worth, uh, uh, you know, going back and, and listening to it or watching it again. Uh, mm -hmm. Because I think there's a lot of information that we talk about, and I and I go through it in a pretty uh, rapid fashion, mm -hmm. so you you may miss something on the first go around. But anyway, let let's talk about uh, you know think up and and you know define uh, think up. Uh, you know, it, it, it definitions to work out, to determine, to solve, have an opinion, to discover, to think through. Uh, and so when I wrote this book, I wrote this book, and it was about stories. And I'm trying to get development officers to think a little bit, uh, you know, and not just uh, react, but to think through some of your situations. And hopefully I'll be able to, as some of these stories evolve, that you listen to these stories that I tell, you'll see what I'm talking about and uh, about thinking about where you are and thinking about what your next steps are. I'll, I'll tell you this. I've, I've gone with development officers uh, on a number of, a meet, number of meetings, and we come out of the meeting, and I will say to the development officer, what what is your next step? What 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 do we do next? And they don't know. They do not know. And I hopefully you know you're going to learn enough through some of these sessions that you will know that there's got to be a next step when you have your first preliminary meeting or cultivation meeting. What is my next step? What do I do next? Uh, so anyway, uh, think about what you're doing and how can you think up and do better. That's that's the point I'm trying to make. Think about it. You know when I. I did my 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 formula for success, uh, you know, BP plus CS times E equals S, you know, basic principles, you know, uh, plus uh, times times uh, your, your common sense, you know, times effort equals success. That that common sense category, that common sense portion of that formula is very very uh, very very important, and I think that's what we're talking about about thinking up. You think up and think through and think out of the box uh, when you're in situation. So in this session, we're going to tell you stories. And uh, we're going to, again, we want you to think outside the box. We want you to think twice or three times or four times, whatever. Think through your situation. Think close. Now, why do I say that? Because in any meeting you go into, the first, the, the first meeting you have with an individual, you need to be thinking about closing. Remember, I, I talked about, you know, uh, contact, cultivate, and close. Those are the three C's uh, that you need, contact, cultivate, and close, uh, you know, in any kind of situation. But what happens is most development officers are very good, very good at contacting and, and very good at, at uh, cultivating, but they're terrible at closing. They don't know how to close. And so I'm trying to teach development officers to start thinking about closing on the very first meeting you go to. That doesn't mean you're necessarily going to going to secure a pledge card or you're going to get a gift in that first meeting, but I want you mind-wise to be thinking about thinking about closing. And then again, we'll of course, think of success for sure. Okay, so how does a need become an opportunity? Remember, we talked about this before. Need, re remove that uh, that word from your vocabulary. Uh, don't use that word. A substitute need for the word opportunity. And so when does need become an opportunity? Need becomes an opportunity when you have a plan, when you have a strategic plan. We have a, a, a way we're going to reach our goal, how we're going to get to point A or point B or point C in our fundraising goals. So again, don't use the word need, use opportunity. Substitute the word opportunity every time for the word need. People who make leadership gifts don't give to needs. They give to opportunities. Okay, so we're gonna think up, we're gonna talk about cultivation, we're gonna think up clothes, we're gonna think up stewardship in, in this presentation. So let's talk about this one. This is a, a, a PS is important. I've been talking about this for years. Uh, I've been saying that you always, always, you put a PS on every letter you send out. Uh, when I was at Auburn years ago, I would sign about 250 thank you letters every Sunday afternoon. 
And uh, and I always wrote a PS on that letter. I always put a PS on the letter. And people say to me, well, what do you put on the PS, Jerry? I said, you can use the first sentence in the letter. In the first sentence in the letter, uh, dear dear Joe, uh, thank you for the impact your gift is making on our uh, on our, our campaign or on our university or on our school or on our organization. You can write that same PS in, in your, it's a handwritten note and you put that in that letter because why? That's what they're going to read. They're not going to, re they're not reading your letter. I'm sorry. You may have spent, you know, two weeks writing that letter. I think it's the greatest letter since, uh, you know, it, but, it, but they're not going to read it. And so you put the PS on there and that's what's important. So let me tell you a story about someone that I work with at a, at a university, and he understands the PS because I've, I've told him that you've got to put a PS on the letter. So here's a gentleman who sent a thousand dollar gift in uh, uh, to the to the university library, and he wrote uh, a thank you note. This person wrote this, he, the, the VP who wrote a thank you note and said, "This is what he said: I appreciate very much your support of our library. As you well know, the library is the cornerstone of our of any institution of higher education, and your gift will dramatically impact our mission of educating students." That's a great PS. That's what he wrote on his letter. He wrote the letter, the thank you letter, but the PS said that. Then about 10 days later, uh, the vice president of, it, of uh, advancement uh, received a handwritten letter from the donor with a check for $10,000 for the library. The note said, your handwritten PS caught my eye and I felt obligated to return a handwritten note. I think your sentiment deserves a larger gift. Please use my gift to strengthen the library and uh, and its reach at the school. Now, you know, that doesn't happen every time, of course, but I think that's a great example of someone reading the PS, getting involved, getting committed, and saying, hey, I, I appreciate that PS. Uh, if, if you had put that, if, if this VP had put his comments in the body of the letter, I dare say that person would have sent another check in for $10,000. I don't believe it would have happened. So anyway, uh, you know, it's the small things that make a difference, the small things that make a difference. And that's what we talk about. I use this this phrase and I'll use it again throughout this presentation. You go the extra mile, you're miles ahead of your competition. Go the extra mile, you're miles ahead of your competition. OK, so let's think involvement. Remember that basic principle that, I, that I've been teaching? The basic principle says if you get a prospect involved, they become what? Committed and the dollars follow the commitment. So again, remember that when you're talking about trying to solicit money or, 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 or solicit people for, for any kind of volunteer effort, you know, if you get them involved, they're gonna get committed, the dollars follow the commitment. That's why we talk about, you know, when you put people on your boards, on your board, you, these people on your board should have affluence and influence, affluence and influence. What are you doing by putting them on the board? You're getting them involved. You get them involved and they're going to get committed and the dollars follow the commitment. Your board ought to be uh, your major donors to any organization you work with. So, again, thinking involvement is really, really important. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell you about uh, the one example is that um, uh, we, we and I've told this story before. I know I've told this before, but, but it's worth repeating. Uh, we did a campaign for a uh, for a school in Mississippi. And during the feasibility study, we interviewed this uh, single parent. And she gave us a range of 50,000 to 100,000. Uh, when we asked her, you know, would you consider uh, without asking for a commitment today, could give us a range of where your possible gift may fall from low to high, considering it could be done over a three year period of time, 50 to $100,000. So we decided, the head of school and I decided we would go see her and asked her to chair the campaign, chair the campaign. Well, we w went to see her and she said, look, I, I, I appreciate this, but I, I'm, I'm a single parent, as you know, I don't know anyone. And I don't think I could do a very good job as chairman of the campaign. So I said, uh, I said, do you, uh, would you consider being a co-chair? Uh, and she said, well, yeah, I can do that. Now, see here, I'm, I'm thinking about this. I'm thinking up. I'm, I'm thinking outside the box. I'm trying to get her involved. And that's what I did. And she said, yeah, I'll do that. So she, we made her the co-chair. And uh, at the end of the campaign, her total gift was $450,000. Now, uh, I can assure you that had we not gotten her involved in the campaign structure, uh, then she would probably have been given somewhere around what she indicated in the feasibility study, uh, fifty dollars to $100,000. Again, thinking involvement is really, really, really important.
Jim Ray, are you on this call? Okay, Jim may not, but this is a this is a Jim Ray hey, story. I, hey Jerry. Yeah. Hey Jerry, here I am. Hey, okay, I'm about to tell a story on you, Jim, and I'll let you tell this story if you want, because it's it, it's uh, it's about your estate gift that you moved from uh, a university uh, to a small university that your granddaughter attended. You want to tell that story? Or you want me to tell it? Go ahead. I'm <laughs> old, so I, my 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 memory may not recollect. Go ahead. Okay, so so okay, the, the story is. Uh, in 2014, my wife and I reviewed our wills and set up a testimony charitable remainder trust to benefit our children, grandchildren, and, and charitable organizations, which we were committed. Uh, you know, I have named a major university where I received my graduate degree into which I've already endowed a scholarship in my mom and dad's honor. And during the 2014 football season, I became alarmed at a student at student behavior at several games and decided to write my concern to the university president, athletic director, and student newspaper and newspaper editor. Uh, and and, and to, to my disappointment, uh, this is what Jim said, to my disappointment, I never received a response to any of my handwritten letters from anyone. Uh, I thought the lack of this response, uh, the less I valued the integrity of those in charge and asked the question, is this where I want my hard earned money uh, hopefully well-invested dollars to go. Uh, so uh, the, the story goes on that he decided to go visit his granddaughter who was at another small uh, college. He visited with the president and based on that meeting, he decided that, that that small college needed his money more than this major university. And that's where he left his uh, uh, some of his estate money. I think it's a great story to tell because uh, you know the point I'm trying to make here is that that you you're going to have in, in any kind of development effort you're going to have negative letters you're going to have negative comments and and you got to respond to those uh, i remember when i was at auburn i'd get negative letters uh, about a number of things and you know what i did i picked up the phone and called them i picked up the phone and called them and and you you'd be surprised people can write the worst letters and and the most negative letters and say the most uh, horrific things but when you get them on the phone, they're an entirely different person. And and I've done that on a number of occasions. And, you know, I just say, I want to follow up on the letter you, you wrote. And I, I'm, I'm sorry you feel this way. It, you know, it really does make things work much better than me writing a letter and and saying to them, you know, hey, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I got your I got your note. Uh, and but I, but I think that the point that I'm trying to make is regardless of what uh, what negative comments may come back to you, respond back to them. You don't have to call them if you don't feel uh, good about doing that, but you can send them a note. And, and it, it, you don't have to solve the problem, but you can just say, I, I really uh, I really appreciate your note. We'll certainly look into it, or whatever you want to say. So again, I think that's, a, uh, again, the point here I'm trying to say is think up, uh, always, always respond to your donors regardless of the comments that they make to you, positive, negatives, or, or whatever. Hey, Jerry, can I tell one more story real quick yeah. since you're telling yeah. stories? Yeah. Uh, about 10 years ago, we had a person to visit the facility where I was serving, and he just drove through. And, I, and one of my, our friends said, this guy drove through your campus, just wanted to let you know. So he sent me his address. So I wrote him a handwritten letter saying, thank you for visiting our facility. Had no idea what his capability was when he drove through. And I told him a little bit about what we were doing and thanked him for just his interest to come, just to come by. He lives in Florida, Naples, Florida. And he was just out visiting. So he got me, he sent me a letter back saying that he appreciated my letter and, and there was a $5,000 check in that uh, letter that he sent. So, uh, so I said, well, certainly thanked him again with a handwritten letter back to him. And then I said, is it possible my wife is going to be, she's a, she was a development officer at that time for another university. She's going to be in that area, and I'd like to come with her and, and come by and visit with you if that's possible. He says, sure, we'd love to have you visit in our home. So we went to Florida and visited with him. And then while we were there, he says, I've got a foundation. I'm going to put you in for 40 grand a year. So that's what can happen when you just give some detailed attention to someone that you may not even know. So 
that's my story. Well, it's a good story, Jim, because it, it just goes back and reflects on what I'm talking about today, and that is thinking up, you know, thinking outside the box, you know, thinking creatively. You you, you thought about this, and you said, hey, this guy this guy drove through the campus. I'll write him a note, and here he always sends you a $5,000 check, and then he commits $40,000 a year. That's what you do. That's what fundraising is all about, and that's why I'm talking about you got to think about this a little bit. So let me tell you this next story. This is a, uh, I was in New York a couple of years ago, visiting prospective donors for a client I was working with. And I met with this gentleman and he said, uh, he said, I just retired from a high level government job in Washington, D.C. He said, I was taking a job in the private sector. He said, this information about me leaving, his, about me leaving the government job uh, and accepting a new position was in the news, it was in the newspaper. He said, he said, shortly after the news release, uh, he said, I got a letter from Princeton University, his alma mater, uh, telling him the company he was going to work for was a matching gift company. Now, I, I'll tell you, I was very impressed. I was very impressed with Princeton's development office. You know, you, are they thinking outside the box? Are they thinking up? Absolutely. They got the article. They, they researched it. They found out he was a graduate of Princeton, and they looked at the company he was going to work for. And, and sent him a note and said, hey, the company you're going to work for is a matching gift company. That's what I'm talking about here. This one is, uh, the, the, you know, all these stories are true stories, by the way. I'm not making anything up. So this one is uh, where a, a donor came to see the vice president of advancement, walked into his office, outer office, and the, the receptionist was there. And he said, I'd like to see the VP, whatever his name was. And the uh, receptionist said, do you have an appointment? And he said, no, I don't. I'm just passing through. And so she said, well, I'm sorry. He's, he's too busy to see you today. He said, oh, okay. And he pulled out a check that he'd already written out. The check was for $20,000. He tore the check up in, in, in tiny pieces and handed it to her and said, give this to the vice president of advancement. So again, you know, you... Uh, you, you, you're never too busy. You're never too busy to see a donor. That, that, that's ridiculous. And I'll tell you this, that VP is not in his position today. He didn't last much longer after that incident. Okay, so uh, let's go to this one. This, this, is a, this is an interesting story to going back for a gift. So uh, a VP for alumni development at a, at a, a university in the, in the South uh, drove to... Uh, to his family's home uh, for a short vacation. And so he uh, he got in the driveway and he's telling me this story. He said, I, I got in the driveway and I had a call. He said, I had a call from from major donor who said, hey, uh, uh, he said, you know, I, I, I'd like to, us to meet in the morning for coffee, uh, you know, and, and then this VP said, okay, great, all right. Uh, he said, the, the, the donor said, I've got something I want to share with you. And he said, uh, okay, so the, the, the VP did not, you know, tell the, the donor, hey, I'm at my parents' home. I just drove in here. Uh, he didn't say that to him. He just said, okay, I'll see you in the morning. So he, he dropped his, his family off. He got back in his car and he drove back seven hours to uh, the university. He met with the, the gentleman in the morning uh, for coffee, and the donor gave him a check for a million dollars. Now I, I was I was very impressed with with uh, with that because ask yourself how many of you would have would have got in the car and drove back to see a donor the, he didn't the donor didn't tell him I've got a million dollar check for you he just said I want to see you I want to talk to you uh, and so again I think that's really really uh, important point that this person this VP made a commitment he made a real commitment that he was going to go back and see him regardless. And he never told the donor. He never told the donor that that he had to drive seven hours to get back um, to 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 meet with him in the morning. He didn't tell him that. Uh, so again, how many of you would have done that? That, that? that you don't have to answer that question out loud. But I think uh, you know there's several of us would who would have had second thoughts about whether we would go. We were going to go drive back, uh, regardless whether it was three hours or two hours or five hours uh, to 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 go meet a, a have a have a meeting with a donor. Again, you go the extra mile, you're miles ahead of your competition. You go the extra mile, you're miles ahead of your competition. All right, this one is a uh, uh, first gift. This 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 gentleman uh, 
it, it says here he gave $50,000, but his first gift was $500,000. The gift came in. He was 95 years old. His first gift was $500,000, not $50,000. And so the plan giving officer immediately picked up the phone and called him and thanked him for that gift. Thanked him for that gift. And then she scheduled a, a trip to go see him. So she she was over in the East Coast and he was on the West Coast and, and she went and visited with him and thanked him in person. Now, uh, she started doing that uh, every year, every year. And then when he turned 100, uh, he gave her a hundred, $800,000 check. He gave her $800,000 more when he turned 100. And at 103, he gave another $100,000. But so so that's that that person understood stewardship. She was thinking up. She was thinking about, hey, I've got to I've got to build a relationship with this gentleman. And so she did it every year. And I'm sure she was calling in when she wasn't visiting with him in person. Uh, again, I think that's a that's a that's a great story. Uh, so that development officer certainly understood stewardship, as I said. Now, uh, this one, St. Francis Hospital, we did a campaign for them. And it was about a $25 million campaign. They were building an addition to the hospital. And we had visited with this couple, the VP for advancement at the hospital. Uh, we, had, we had visited with, with this couple on a number of occasions and we had screened them and we knew this couple was capable of a seven figure gift. And we talked to them, we talked to them about the, 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 the campaign. They certainly had an interest in the campaign. Uh, they, they were, they were uh, former patients at the hospital. Uh, and so what, when we sat down, the VP and I sat down and started talking about this, how can we move this person? How can, how can, let's think about how we can move this person to making that million dollar gift that we'd like for them to, to make. So I told him, I said, let's, let's take a picture of the lobby and let's get their names put in the lobby. Like, like it would be showing, uh, what, what it's going to be if, if they, if they, uh, if they gave us the, the money. And so we took that, that photograph. It was a color photograph that we made up. And we showed it to them. Now, I, I mean, I wish you could have been there because I wish you could have seen the glow on their face uh, when they saw their names and where those names would be on that wall. And so they they signed a pledge card for a million dollars. That that's a that's a good story. Uh, but again, I, I've said this before. I don't like to say, sell naming opportunities. I like to sell the project. And in recognition of a gift this size, you know, we'd like to put your name in the lobby. And that's what I did. That's what I sold. I sold the project and the impact that, that this uh, addition to the hospital would make. And in recognition of your your gift of a, of a million dollars, we'd like to put your names on the on the wall in the lobby, naming the lobby after you. And and then we showed them the picture. And so uh, that's when they signed that pledge card. So in this case, you know, you you talk about you know a picture is worth a thousand words. In this case, a picture is worth a million dollars. So let's go, let's talk about this one. A million ask and close. We we did a feasibility study for, for with a gentleman and uh, he gave us a uh, range of 50,000 to 100,000. Can you see some of these stories I'm talking about, they're, they're coming out of the feasibility study. The feasibility study is so important to any uh, campaign you go into because here we found this gentleman who was certainly capable. He gave us a, a number of 50,000 to $100,000 in the study. Uh, we had already uh, screened him and had realized that he was capable of much more than that. And so we decided to uh, ask him to chair the campaign. And so we went to see him, took the college president with us, went to see him and asked him to chair the campaign. Now, I didn't go in there to ask him to chair the campaign and ask him for a gift at the same time. I never do that. I never want to mix those together. I want to separate that. So I went to ask him for, to be the chairman of the campaign first, and he agreed to do that. Uh, and then we came back uh, several weeks later and said, uh, now that you've agreed to be a co-chair, uh, we'd like to sit down and talk to you about your personal commitment to the campaign. And and so we did. Uh, we met with him. The VP and I met with him uh, for breakfast. And so we sat there and we went through my five steps. Remember the five steps. Uh, and we got to the point of the ask. And I asked him, would he consider a gift of $250,000? payable equal amounts of $50,000 per year over the next five years in support of the campaign. He hesitated a, a couple of minutes or a minute, and he said, how many people have made a $250,000 pledge this campaign so far? 
And I said, all of the co-chairs, we had four co-chairs in this campaign. All of the co-chairs had made a gift of $250,000 or more. He said, after I said that, he said, I'm going to do the $250,000, but I'm going to do more. You're in my place. You're sitting there. And what would you say? Now, I, I use this a lot in, in, in my training. What would you say? And I get a lot of different responses here, but but it's pretty simple. I said, how much more? And he said, a million dollars. Now, what did I say? What was I, what would I say? I said, you know, if you looked at my five steps, if you look at those, those uh, accomplice cards I gave you, you'd know exactly what I said next. I said, do you feel comfortable signing a pledge card for that amount today? What am I doing? I'm trying to close, right? Remember, you got to close here. I'm, 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 I would tell you this. There are a lot of development officers. If he said, I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to do $250,000 and more, would have never asked the question, how much more? And then if I said, how much more? And he said, a million dollars. I'm not sure they would have, uh, uh, they would have pulled out their pledge card and got it, got it committed. I had a pledge card in my pocket, which I carry with me all the time. I pulled out my pledge card and said, do you feel comfortable signing a pledge card for that amount today? Remember this. I talked about it last week or when we did our, our session four. It's about 50-50. 50% of the people say yes, 50% say no when you ask that question. In this particular case, he said yes. And and he went ahead and, and he signed the pledge card. And within an hour, we walked out of there with a million dollar pledge card. So, you know, he actually came back and did another million dollars um, in his estate um, for uh, for the school. So he, he had $2 million. That's a long way in it from that fifty dollars to $100,000 in that feasibility study. But it goes back to that, that point I made earlier about what? Getting him involved. Now, had we not gotten him involved in the campaign, if we had not asked him to be a co-chair in the campaign, I don't think he would have given much more than $100,000. Maybe, maybe a little bit more, but I don't think he would have. We got him involved. And once he got involved, he got committed, the dollars followed commitment. Now, here's another story. Never assume. Never assume. Development officers are great at assuming things. And, you know, you, you should go in and, and ask questions. I've talked about this before. Development officers don't ask enough questions. So here's a study. These building studies showed that this donor gave us a range of $50,000 to $100,000. So, so uh, Mark Martin, who is a one of our one of our uh, employees and works with us, and has been with me for over ten years, and is one of the most experienced and knowledgeable fundraisers in the business, uh, shared this story with me. He said, "I, I went on site uh, to work with the school, and so I knew we were going to we were going to solicit this gentleman uh, today." And so he said to the 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 VP for uh, development, he said, "What's our ask amount?" And she said, I've prepared a packet and we're going to ask him for $30,000. He said, why? Why are we asking for 30? He gave us a range of 50 to 100. She said, oh, well, I just assume that he gives to the uh, other areas of the school. He, he gives two scholarships. Uh, he gives a, a major gift to the annual fund every year. And I just didn't think he would do that. And so we just decided to ask him for 30. Well, uh, listen, that's a bad mistake. And so Mark Martin, to his credit, said, no, nope, we're going to ask him for 125000 We always go up on that high number. That high number, we don't deal with a low number. We deal with a high number. We always go up on that high number by 25 or 30%. And so in this case, we went in, Mark and the development officer went in and asked him for $125,000 that day. He not only agreed to the 125000 he signed a pledge card for that amount at that meeting. So, you know, you never assume, never make assumptions here. Uh, that, that's how you get in trouble. Okay, so here's one that, that uh, uh, was probably the largest estate gift I've ever been a part of. Uh, the, the VP and I were meeting with this gentleman who was a retired, I think he was a retired chemistry professor, and we were talking to him about a, a uh, this was a cultivation call, and we were talking to him about wanting to, to asking his permission to bring a proposal back to him for his consideration on behalf of the campaign. He said, look, I'm, I'm 88 years old or at that time, whatever age, he said, I'm too old to make a pledge for, for four or five years or whatever. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm not ready to do that. So I said, I said, have you ever thought about after your, after your church and your children, have you ever thought about putting the school in your estate plans? And he said, they are in my will. I said, how much did you put in your will for the school? And he said, I think it's $20 million. 
Well, we, we fell out of our chair and we got up and I said, would you be willing to put that in writing and, and verify that? And he said, yeah. So he did. He came back in a couple of weeks and said, you know, it's not not 20 million, it's 17 million. Now, that was years ago. And that gentleman, uh, that gentleman, probably that estate is worth a lot more than the 17 million dollars he, he committed to. Uh, that will be uh, that is a transformational gift. If you want to look up that word transformational, look it up, because that is a transformational gift that's going to make a huge difference at that university. Now, I, I said to him, too, I said, How'd you accumulate all this money? He said, I buy stock and I never sell. I never sell. And he said, I'll buy stock that, that pays dividends. He, he said, I get over a million dollars a year in dividends. But he told me the story. He said, I uh, had a friend of mine, John Amos, who, who founded the company Aflac. Some of you heard of Aflac. He said he, he founded that company. He came to see me one day and he said, um, he said I'm, I'm starting this company and I'd like to ask you if you'd buy some stock in the company. And, and he said, yeah, I agreed to buy some stock. He said, I didn't buy much, but he said, I had to go to the bank and borrow the money. And he said, I think I borrowed about, he said, I think I, I paid about $900 for my stock. And today he's the single largest stockholder at Aflac, the single largest stockholder. Can you imagine how many times that stock is, is, is divided or split? So it's an interesting story. You never know, you never know, but be prepared to think about it when that kind of situation comes up. Think about what's our next steps. When he said, I don't want a proposal. I don't want to bring a proposal. You know, at that age, I'm certainly going to come back and say, you know, would you, uh, would, and I always use that word. I'll use that phrase after your church and your children, because if you don't use that phrase, they always come back and say, well, I got to leave money in my church. I got to leave money in my children. I say, after your church and your children, would you consider putting the school in your estate plans? And he said, they're already in my estate plans. The school didn't know that. They didn't know. They didn't. They didn't have a clue that this person had all this in in their estate. Then the other story I want, I want to talk about is getting around the gatekeeper. That that's a really good story because you know you're going to have those situations happen. And, and th I'll never forget this story. I made an appointment to visit with the CEO of a major corporation large, located in a large southern city. When I got to the office on the top floor of the of the corporate offices, I was immediately met by the CEO's executive assistant. We, we talked small talk a little bit, and she indicated the CEA, CEO could not uh, meet me today, would not be able to see me today. But she said she'd be glad to help me if she could. I proceeded to tell her about the campaign and where we were, and asked, I asked her permission, asked her permission to bring a proposal back, to, back for the CEO and the company's consideration. She told me that uh, she'd be, be glad to, to, to look at that proposal, and she said, I have the authority to make gifts of $25,000 or more. So if you send me a proposal, I can commit to $25,000. I said, thank you very much, and we'll get back to you in a couple of weeks. So I went back, and I remember sitting in my car. After that meeting, I said, no way am I going to ask that, that company for $25,000. They're a huge company. They have a lot of resources. And I'm not going to ask them for twenty five thousand dollars. So, and two weeks later, I called the executive assistant back and said, "We have a proposal ready to present. We'd like to present the proposal to the CEO and thank him uh, for his possible gift." And she said she was agreeable, and she scheduled scheduled the day and time. And so, I assembled seven people, seven representatives from Auburn that went with me on that meeting. Now, here's a basic principle that I I teach. Anyone who goes on a solicitation, anyone who goes on a solicitation has to have a role. You don't bring someone along just to look good. They have to have a role. So I had seven people there, and every one of them had a, an assigned role that they were going to talk about in that particular meeting. So here's what happened. When we all walked into the meeting, there was, a, there was one of the seven people that was on our foundation board, and he was also on the board of that company. So we walk in, and the, and he was leading the way, by the way. He was the first one in. He, he, the board member walked in and said to the CEO, he said, the university is going to ask you for, for $750,000, but I think you ought to give him a million dollars. Well, you know, that, that blows your cover right away, right? You know, uh, but anyway, we sat down, and, and the CEO was sitting in a chair facing the seven of us. We we're lined up, got seven chairs facing him. He's got a, he's got a clipboard. And he's making notes. And uh, 
And so we did. We asked him for $750,000. He didn't respond to anything. He didn't respond much to, to any comment we made. He didn't respond definitely to that board member's comment. And um, so he just sat in his chair and didn't say much, uh, which is not a good sign, right? That's not a very good sign um, that he just sat there and listened to us. A month later, we received a letter from the CEO stating the company would commit a five-year pledge of $500,000. We later learned this was the largest gift the company had ever made. And I would say this to you, uh, that's a long way from $25,000. What was I doing there? Was I, was I thinking about this? Absolutely. I was trying to think up. I was thinking outside the box. Uh, I was thinking twice. I was thinking three times. I was trying to figure out a way we can go in there and make that presentation because they were capable of it. And, you know, getting around the gatekeeper, that, that's, that's a really, really uh, important point to get around her. But I think we handled that well. Uh, because when I called her, I said, you know, we'd like to come back and make the presentation to the CEO. She's thinking we're coming in and asking for $25,000. Uh, I can imagine she was shocked when when uh, when she found out what we asked for. But I never saw her again. Uh, but but I, I will tell you this this quick story. This is not on my on my list. I went to see this gentleman when I was at Auburn, and he had he is uh, was well known in Birmingham, uh, a philanthropist. Uh, he had given the University of Alabama a million dollar chair uh, in, uh, I forget what the name of the chair was, but 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 it was a million dollar chair. And so I went to see him and this was a cultivation call. This was a preliminary call. This was a call to ask permission to bring a proposal back to him. We sat down in a little couch area in his office. He had a large office and, and it was a big company. And so I began telling him about the campaign. And I began telling him, you know, about wanting to come back and, and schedule a meeting or ask permission to bring a proposal. He said, excuse me, just one minute. He, he stood up, walked over to his desk, pulled out his checkbook, wrote me a check for $25,000. Walked over and handed it to me. He said, here's my commitment to the campaign. Now, this was in my younger days. I said, thank you. And I left. Now, that was a mistake. I should have said, thank you but we really would like to sit down and talk to you about a leadership gift that will be transformational in our campaign. I didn't say that. Uh, I took his $25,000 and, and walked out. Uh, again, you learn from your mistakes and I certainly learned from mine. Okay, let's talk about this next one, the bottom line. Here's a guy that's 95 years old and uh, I just really heard, heard this story. Uh, it, it said that the school uh, had secured this this largest gift the school had ever received, and, and after months of cultivation, uh, the president had a verbal commitment from this very elderly gentleman, very elderly gentleman, that he was ready to sign a pledge for a $100 million gift, $100 million gift. The president of the school and the VP for advancement uh, went to see this gentleman in New York City at his office, and when they walked in, uh, the gentleman, the donor, was sitting behind a conference table or sitting in a large conference table, and about 10 lawyers were sitting behind him. The president opened his briefcase, pulled out a stack of papers about a foot high for the donor to review before signing. The gentleman, who was 95 years old, 95 years old, looked at the president and said, I could be dead before I finish reading all these pages. So he said, let's get to the bottom line. And the donor, or the prospective donor at that time, began flipping through all the pages very quickly, until he came to the last page that required his signature, he signed his name to the dismay of, of all the attorneys in the room. So again, you've got to figure this out sometime. You know, uh, we talk about body language, and there's some people who want to talk and talk and talk and talk. There are other people who want to get to the bottom line. You, as a development officer, have to be able to, to uh, determine who are those people and what is my approach with them. Again, some want to talk and will keep talking. Uh, some want to get to the bottom line. And in this particular case, this gentleman said, hey, I'm 95 years old. I'd be dead by the time I got through all this, uh, all these papers. Uh, and he went right to the bottom line and signed the, signed the page. This is an interesting story. Uh, this is a, uh, I call it dogs and more dogs. Uh, this happened before I was at Auburn. Uh, th th there was a gentleman who was a wealthy uh, Great Lakes shipping owner he became interested in the vet school at Auburn University, specifically research uh, center 
for the Department of Small Animal Surgery and Medicine uh, at the College of Veterinary Medicine at Auburn University. And he offered to match contributions to the research fund to assist the center. And he said, anybody that gives a gift, I'll match it dollar for dollar. Well, we had a veterinarian living in uh, South Florida, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, his name was Dr. Uh, Fredrickson, and he was a well-known practicing physician, uh, veterinarian in Hollywood, Florida. And uh, he had a client. Her name was Miss Eleanor Ritchie. And so she, uh, he told her, she came in with her dogs and he said, she was always driving a new Cadillac and she had a, always had a, uh, a lot of dogs that she brought in to be uh, for us to talk about and, and work on. And said, she said, I mean, he, he said, I told her at the time, he said, Miss Ritchie, uh, there's a, there's, if you make a gift to, the, to Auburn, uh, them, there's a donor who will match that gift. Uh, she didn't do that. She didn't give any money to that fund. But at her death in 1968, she left her entire state to Auburn Small Animal Clinic research program. It turns out that Miss Ritchie was the granddaughter uh, of the co-founder of Quaker State Oil, and so her gift reported to Auburn was worth $4.2 million, which at that time was the largest single gift that Auburn had ever received, $4.2 $4 million. However, there was a catch, and the catch was it stip the will stipulated that none of the estate would transfer to Auburn until the last of the 162 dogs that had been sheltered on her 192-acre ranch died of natural causes. The last dog, and first of all, what do you think we did? The first thing we did, we separate the men, the male and female dogs, of course. But the last dog died on June the 4th, 1984. That's 16 years later. 16 years it took before all those dogs died. And the amount transferred to Auburn at that time was over $12 million. Uh, again, Dr. Dr. Uh, Fredrickson had no idea Miss Ritchie had this kind of wealth. Uh, you know, he just knew that she was she loved dogs. And, and uh, you know, my advice to you as fundraisers is, you know, treat everyone the same. Be genuine, sincere to all donors. You never know. You never know. You know, there was a, there was a book written several years ago called A Millionaire Next Door. You cannot tell anymore who that person with, with resources are or have. And so, again, treat everybody the same. And, you know, sometimes it will certainly um, come back uh, to benefit you. All right, let's 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 talk about this one is uh, the 60-30-10 plan. Now, I thought this was interesting because uh, I worked with a Christian school up in, uh, up in North Alabama, and there was a grandparent who uh, said to the head of school, he said, you know, I, I know uh, whatever you raise in your annual fund at this time, I'll match it. So they raised about $75,000. He gave them a check for $75,000. Uh, we we interviewed this individual in a feasibility study. Here we go again, doing a feasibility study before a campaign. And he gave us a range. This gentleman gave us a range of $100,000 to $250,000. So we decided that, you know, we needed to certainly, when we started the campaign, we needed to go see him and, and talk to him uh, as a grandparent and to ask him for a seven-figure gift. We had already done a research. He was certainly capable of that. He was capable of doing a, a, a much larger gift. And so the, the head of school and I, we, we flew to Tampa, Florida. That's where he lived, Tampa, Florida. And so when we were, we were uh, talking about this on the way to the meeting, the head of school said, Jerry, I put two proposals together, one for two million, one for three million. So we get in the meeting, we can decide which proposal we'll make to him. I said, no, I can't do that. I said, I don't do that. I can't decide in a meeting. I don't have two proposals to decide to based on the on the on the, the flow of the meeting or the positive or negative of the meeting, decide which proposal I'm gonna present. So we go in with one proposal, not two. And so I said, we'll go with two million. We'll go in and ask it for two million dollars. So that's what we did. We went in, we made the presentation to him. Uh, we asked him for $2 million. And he said, one of the things he said to me, he said, you've done your research, I can tell you that. He said, what did I tell you in the feasibility study though? And I told him, 100,000 to 250,000. He said, that's a long way from, from what, I, what I gave to you. Uh, I said, yes, sir, but we, we certainly, uh, to, to be successful in this campaign, we're having to challenge people uh, to give anything and everything they can to reach our goal. So he said, well, let me tell you this story. He said, I've got a 30, 
I've got a 60, 30, 10 plan. He said, I've decided that I'm going to give 60% of what I make to the church and Christian education, 30% to maintain my current living style and 10% to my children. I thought that was really an interesting plan. And I've, I've, I've told this story again. It's, 36, it's 60, 30, 10 plan. Now, uh, the end of that story is uh, a few days after the meeting, he called the head of school and committed a million and a half dollars uh, towards the, the building project. Uh, so I, I believe I, I, the gift was based on his belief in the mission and the leadership of the school. And remember, that's 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 one of the main reasons people give to any nonprofit organization is, number one, they believe in the mission. They believe in what you do. If they don't believe in what you do, then they're certainly not going to give back to you. Let's talk about this. When a donor tells you what, what they're going to do, uh, th there's a there's a, a story here that you need to learn from because uh, we went into a campaign uh, with a school and the chairman of the campaign and myself went to this uh, uh, grandparents home. We walk in and I may have told this story before, but it's worth telling you again. We walk in and the, the, the gentleman said, I know why you're here. Uh, we're going to give you five hundred dollars. Now, I've got a proposal in my hand. Remember, I never put my proposal down, never put it down on the table, never put it down uh, on, the, on, the, on the chair or couch or whatever. I put it, I hold on to it. And my proposal is a proposal for $50,000. So I said to him, thank you. We appreciate that $500 uh, pledge or gift. However, that's not the amount I have in my proposal. She said, well, how, what do you have in your proposal? And I, and I started with step number two and worked my way through. And I got to the, the ask amount in step number four and said, um, what I'd like to, you consider to do is $50,000, payable equal amounts of $16,000 plus per year over the next uh, three years in, in support of the campaign. And she, he said, well, oh, if it's over three years, we might be able to do that. Well, they didn't do 50,000, but they did 15,000, and that's a long way from $500. So uh, let me talk to you about another another story uh, that uh, I, I want to talk about, and that is um, we had a donor that that um, came in to see a, a, this is a university, and he came in and said to the, to the development officer, we know, we know you're in the campaign. We've been we've been pretty involved, and we'd like to commit five million dollars to the campaign. Now this person's capable of that and more. So the development officer said, "He's thinking up. He's thinking up." He said, "Thank you for that five million dollars. However, would you consider another five million deferred, put in your estate plans?" And uh, the donor said, "Well, let me talk to my wife. We'll we'll, we'll think about that." He came back the next day. He met him that next morning when he was coming to work. And he said, my wife and I have talked about it. And yes, we will do that. So they got $10 million out of that gift. Now, now think about that. He could have said to that person, $5 million, that's a great gift. Thank you for that gift. We appreciate that. That's going to really make a, a huge impact in our campaign. But the development officer was thinking up, thinking about it. He was thinking, hey, maybe, maybe he, and he was at the age where uh, he could certainly uh, the consider an estate gift or deferred gift. So let me, uh, as we're, we're trying to finish up here, um, uh, I, I read a book. Well, no, wait a minute. I want, I want to talk about this. Uh, uh, a graduate of Notre Dame, I read this in the Chronicle of Philanthropy, and a, a graduate of Notre, Notre Dame and his wife made a $100 million estate gift with no strings attached to the institution in 2017. Now that in itself, that in itself is very unusual for anyone to make that size gift, that size of gift with no strings attached. So he did $100 million. But they said, uh, what, what would you, what are you looking for from fundraisers? And he, they listed, he and his wife listed four points that they would like fundraisers to know. Number one, number one, know what is important in a donor's life. When you show us that you know about us, that goes a long way. Know what is important in a donor's life. You have to figure that out. What's important in a donor's life? Know about that. Number two, don't ask for money. Make donors feel there's zero expectation to give. Now, that that certainly is in the early preliminary meetings. You're not going to be asking for money. 
And you've got to understand that when you're building that relationship and you're building that trust, uh, then you make the donors feel like regardless, you know, that, that there's zero ex expectation to give. Uh, but there's a point in time where you've got to make that ask. Number three is don't take a donor. This is what they said. Don't take a donor's help for granted. He said, we had an, uh, a nonprofit organization that came to us and they wanted us to host a dinner. He said, so we hosted a dinner with a celebrity chef. We raised $1.7 million. He said, the next year, they asked us to do it again. We reluctantly agreed, but we said to the organization, this is the last. We won't do this again. But in this particular dinner, the second dinner, we raised over $2 million. And sure enough, the charity came back the third time, and we said, no, we're not doing it again. So don't take a donor's help for granted. Number four, make acknowledgments and communications personal. Don't send me a mug. I thought this was a great point. Don't send me a mug. They're not interested in those kind of things. Make acknowledgments and communications personal and do the simple things like sending handwritten cards and notes to individuals. So, you know, listen to what your donors are saying. Pay attention. Listen to those four points. I think those are, those are great four points. All right, my last point that I want to make, I read a book uh, several years ago, and it was entitled uh, Abusing Donor Intent by Doug White. And it's a story about Charles and Marie Robertson, who gave $35 million in 1961 to Princeton's Woodrow Wilson School for Public Policy and International Affairs. It was the largest one-time gift amount at, at, at the time to anyone had ever donated to benefit a university. By 2002, the fund had grown to 700 million. By the spring of 2008, it had grown to over 850 million. Beginning in 2002, uh, Bill Robinson, the son of Charles and Marie, filed a lawsuit against Princeton University claiming they did not follow the intent and instructions of his parents. The lawsuit took six years and Bill and his family won and took the money back, 40 million for legal fees and 100 million to be used to start a new foundation. Uh, so again, the, the point I'm, I'm trying to make here is, you know, you've got to honor the donor's intent. In this particular case, they had all this money coming into the to the Woodrow Wilson School of Public Policy, International Affairs. Other uh, uh, departments and schools and colleges on the Princeton campus, uh, for instance, they had the uh, you know, the dean of the College of Business. They gave an example that he needed a new carpet in his office. Well, he called over there and and they sent him money. To carpet his, his office using this money that Charles and Marie Robinson had given uh, for, the, for their, their public policy and international affairs. That's one of the stories, and there were many stories how they did not follow the intent of the donor, and that's very, very important. So I think that when you're in a, uh, uh, when, you, when you're putting together a, a, uh, an agreement, you know, be sure that you review the terms of that endowment uh, uh, gifts and, and make sure that you're, you're following the intent of the, of the donor. And be specific, uh, you know, the, the charity should provide information to the donor or the donor's family in a timely manner. Uh, and it's really important that, that, uh, that donors, need to more donors need to be more diligent in tracking how their money is used. Hold the charitable accountable. Hold the charitable accountable. This is so important. I, I just think this is, this is a great story because it's so unfortunate that a school of the reputation of Princeton would allow that to happen. And, and that, again, is the responsibility of the board, responsibility of the VP, responsibility of the president uh, to make sure that that doesn't happen. So anyway, I've, 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 I've talked to you about thinking up. I hope I've made my point today about thinking about where you are, what you're doing, how do we do something differently, uh, how do we think outside of the box, how do we think up, uh, all of those are important uh, points that you as a development officer, if you if you have not uh, uh, created those or, or understand those policies, you know, then maybe you can you you can learn from some of these stories I've told you. I think we're right at the end of this hour. Uh, again, I, I, this is this is recorded. If you want to go back and listen to it again, I think that would be fine. I, I'll, any any comments or questions? I'd be glad to answer any of those. If not, thank you for thanking up. Thank you, Jerry.